Hi, right, this will be the third and last lecture for Chapter 1. There is an appendix math review in Chapter 1, but in terms of the chapter itself, this will be the last lecture. And here we look at economic models. At the end of uh, Lecture 2, we talked about the scientific method. And using the scientific method, we would gain a lot of knowledge of how the economy works. We would take that knowledge and put it together to form an economic model to allow us to explain economic behavior and allow us to make predictions. So an economic model is a collection of tested economic theories that have been accepted and can be used to explain the operations of certain parts of the economy. So know, for, uh, know about models that models are an abstraction of reality. It's not the same thing as reality. We take out what we need for our models and ignore everything else. That, allow, that allows us to simplify the analysis. The whole economy is very complex. We can't see anything if we look at everything at once. So extrapolate, take out things that, um, uh, that you want to look at, and again, ignore everything else. Many people criticize economists for doing this, saying our models are not realistic. But they're missing the whole point. Models are not meant to be realistic. Model building and uh, climate science and biology and physics and uh, um, psychology is all designed to make analysis simpler. Think of a map. A map is a model. So if you want to f come to, say, Chaffey College and you want to find the main buildings, the parking lots, where the bookstore is, things like that, if we're, if we're allowed on campus ever again, um, then you want a map. Now, the map is not the real thing. The real thing is Chaffey College is very, very complex. You get lost in it. So a map is a tool. You know, that's what models. Models are tools. A map is a tool that allows us to simplify the analysis and to strip away all the complexity to figure out what we need to, to uh, uh, the, the basic uh, uh, areas of Chaffee College that we need to uh, get to. Again, bathrooms would be nice to have, things like that. And then if you want to drive from here to New York City, the map you want is going to be even less realistic than the one for Chaffee, less detailed, because you don't want all that to drive from here to New York City. Models can be presented as words pictures, graphs, and equations. And in your textbook, you have all four. What I'll do right now is I'll give you an example of, a, of an economic model. I like this model because it does introduce the idea of models, but it does also show the difference between micro and macroeconomics. And this is known as a circular flow model. And what it does is it separates the economy into two sectors, into the producer sector, where we have our businesses, our factories, uh, our offices, and they purchase resources, land, labor, capital, and then also entrepreneurship, which is a special kind of resource, uh, being able to run, run businesses and so forth, take risk, uh, used to manufacture goods and services in order to sell them. And then we have the consumer sector, which earns income from uh, renting out land, working for wages, getting interest, say, on, on loans and profit, and by selling resources in order to purchase goods and services. So you would ask, where would I be in this model? And most likely, you're in two sectors at the same time. When you go to work, you're in the producer sector. And when you act as a consumer or you get your paycheck, that would be in the consumer sector. Now, this is a very simplified version of the macroeconomy. We leave out a lot of other areas out there, which I'll talk about in a minute. So we have over here our, our, our producer sectors. This is the, uh, the, the offices, the factories, again, uh, the colleges. Um, where I work. And the consumer sector is the households, uh, people like you and me as well. So again, I'm in both. When I'm at Chaffee College working, I'm here. And when I go to, say, uh, a store, Costco, to buy something, I'm over here. So down here we have our factor markets. These are our, our resources. These are our factors of production. So we have resources flowing this way from the consumer sector. That would be uh, you and I going to work, be people renting land out, and so forth. And in the factor markets, that is where microeconomics takes place. Microeconomics is in there, and it, uh, microeconomics uses supply and demand to determine the prices of labor, the prices of capital, the prices of land. And those resources are purchased by the producers, and they come to here to work. And then income flows out of the producers as they pay for these resources. They go into the factor markets here, and the markets determine each uh, resource's share of that income. And the income flows in over here into your bank accounts. 
and then you can use that money to buy things. So down here we have our supply side of the economy. This is where production takes place and the supply takes place. At the top here, this is you and I going shopping. So if you go online to Amazon and buy things, that's you right there. We are expending money. We have expenditures. And that money is flowing into the product markets. These are the markets for goods and services. And that's microeconomics as well. In there, we have supply and demand that determines the price for all the things that you and I buy, the price for apples, the price for new cars, the price for lawnmowers. And then products are produced by the manufacturers. They come to the stores. We buy them. We take them home right here. So that you and I taking things home from Costco. And that's the money flowing into the producer sector for them to use that money to pay their resources, uh, to pay their shareholders, and so forth. So the flows themselves, the major flows themselves, is macroeconomics. So these arrows is macroeconomics. And in the boxes is microeconomics. And I have a few minutes here. I want to talk about one of the main problems in economics, and that is if we don't spend all this money. So I talked about the problem of savings. So let's say that over here we have maybe, I'll make up a number, say $10,000 billion of money flows out of the producer sector into the consumer sector. So we have $10,000 billion over here. Now if we don't spend all that money up here in the product markets, then the manufacturer is going to be in trouble because they've spent out $10,000 million down here. And if we don't use that money up here to buy things, then they're not going to sell all the things that they produce. Something to know about macroeconomics, and that is production, always equals income. If you produce a $20,000 car, I can break that $20,000 into all the income components that were used to make that car. Some would go to workers for wages, some of the $20,000 would go to uh, uh, suppliers of energy, suppliers of raw materials, uh, suppliers of your capital equipment, some would go to uh, the shareholders as a form of profit, but that $20,000 that was over here all went somewhere over here. It's, it's broken down income for someone. Money doesn't disappear. So if we only spend say $8,000 billion, then we have $2,000 billion that have been set aside. And therefore, that could create a problem for the macroeconomy. If we're only buying 80% of what we produce, then they have 20% surplus of goods unsold, which probably can lead to a downturn in the economy. So one of the major problems of macroeconomics is to make sure that every dollar that is spent by business and earned by the consumer sector is spent somehow. Now notice that I left off main areas of our macroeconomy. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. I've talked about savings. Well, where, where is the financial sector? Where are the banks? Money flows into banks. Money flows out of banks. So I could have over here, I could have banks, financial, uh, the financial sector. And that would make the model more complex but more realistic. And so maybe money can flow through here, our savings. And money can flow back in in the form of loans, which actually is critical for our economy. And I don't have the government sector here. Money flows to the government sector. Taxes are paid to government. If I put government in here, again, it's becoming more complex. You can see that. Money flows here in the form of taxation. And then the money flows out when government buys things as well. They buy military equipment. They pay for highway construction and so on. That's gov, G, G O V. And they also hire resources here as well. So you can see by adding in more sectors of the economy, it becomes much more complex. Now it's becoming a big mess. And having added in uh, international trade as well. So you can see that your models can be as simple as you want them to be. And, and what I did initially was just to show you the basic differences between macro and, ma and microeconomics and one of the main problems with macroeconomics, which is the problem of not spending all the money that's earned. We'll stop there, and this really is an introduction of things we'll be talking about over and over and over again in this class.